I just want to start by thanking <clears throat> Maya and Anna initially. Um, I know the hard work they're putting in to organize all of these and um, maybe we are the ones talking, the, the webinar session holders, but I just wanted to acknowledge um, the hard work they put and the help they give me uh, throughout the Megaphone event and for this webinar. So let's just take a deep breath and um, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Mark. I am based in Barcelona and I've been working with TechSoup for the last six, seven months. Um, I am working around content uh, strategies and engagement strategies for various projects. And before that, I worked with um, different NGOs, um, positive change making organizations and their online presence um, initiatives. And before that, I worked with, um, I worked at Google and YouTube um, and I gained quite a lot of insight um, on what to do, what not to do um, around online marketing. But maybe instead of saying online marketing, we should refer to this concept as um, online presence maybe um, because it's maybe it used to be a choice being out there online um, or not but nowadays not being out there is already making a statement about your organization your cause and um, so I'm guessing we all need to become more conscious um, about our presence online and this is digital marketing in a time of fire. Um, I think it's quite relevant today. Um, and for those who are not sure today's Thursday, um, I know a lot of people are finding it more difficult to, to keep track of time. Um, and this is what it does, no? Fire, it changes, it disrupts our day-to-day -day lives. Um, the original presentation, I didn't change it from Megaphone. I'm sure you will find it relevant to today, but I hope you don't just think about what's happening today and try to think about your efforts around online presence, around digital marketing, um, because FIRE has happened before, is happening now, and it will happen in different areas, in different spaces, um, maybe around our cause, around our initiatives, maybe outside, but we can assume that it will somehow impact everybody and especially the, the vulnerable communities. And I think what we can do and how we can simplify our efforts will improve the lives of people that actually need the awareness and the change that, is, we, are, that we are creating out of this. Um, so, Let's start by looking at the agenda. Um, today we will aim to simplify, like I said, digital marketing concepts um, from managing a database to tracking user behavior to creating content. Um, and when we think of fire, urgency, and events out of the ordinary, it's logical to set our starting point from the preparation stage, basically. Um, while we have the time at this stage, we can set things up such as our constituency database and create accounts, think more about content and think, have time to think about creating strategies instead of taking the actual actions. Um, because later when fire takes place, like it's happening right now, we may need to be quick with less time and we will have less time to think. And at this stage, we need to pre, um, determine roles, content, and manage content, um, and there will be a lot of outreach. Uh, there will be a lot of posting, a lot of writing, um, and this is where we intentionally put forward our narrative for the public, basically, um, to see the reality, to see our work, um, and the quality of our work during fire is usually determined by our work pre-fire. Um, and lastly, post-fire. And this is where our database comes into play. And of course, keeping in touch with our constituencies. And um, I'm gonna remind you one thing. 
and user-centric intent-based. Hopefully, I will remind you this throughout this session because I believe that these two can simplify our decision-making, eliminate confusion, and most importantly, actively push us to think about our greater goal as an organization, as an activist, or whichever way you're trying to create positive impact in this ever-changing environment. And in time of fire, we also experience a crisis internally and, and within our organization, even within ourselves, physically and mentally. And that brings additional chaos and roadblocks when it comes to planning and acting rationally. Um, and this is why we all need to prepare ourselves as well as our ways of working to prevent that fire bursting on our decision-making processes. Because I believe the public looks at us um, to be coherent, to be rational, and to show the right direction, basically. So preparation is key. It enables us to act fast and smart and be able to rather automize our action plan from the first moment of the first flame of fire. Um, so let's start. So when you look at this statement, um, considering the volunteers, staff members, donors, potential donors, event attendees, it's really a lot to track. And there's great value in keeping track of our communications through maybe just simple spreadsheets. And it may sound too much work already, but imagine all the hours we spend trying to remember how we met someone. And um, it's that moment when we can't put our finger on it. Like we know this person, but how? And it happens in our social interactions as well. I mean, it happens to me a lot. And um, now let's take that simple spreadsheet and upload it to a basic, free or paid, whatever, CRM tool. And by using simple tags, by segmenting our contacts, we are now able to know exactly how we met that person. Um, and if the goal is to grow our constituency base and amplifying our voice, um, and of course through the public support, then taking this aspect seriously will make things much easier because it will get too big to handle if we don't keep it organized. I suggest you to think that you will definitely be able to reach out to more people. You will definitely be successful in your work. Um, but the question to ask there, how am I gonna keep all this organized? And thankfully there are a lot of tools for it and I'm sure you know this already. Um, but I think instead of getting lost in choosing the right tool, um, let's start by asking how we want this to serve us. So from, from many possible reasons, I want to focus on organizing our communication and outreach. By tagging and segmenting, we stop sending one email to all our contacts, but rather we personal, personalize our outreach because we want our outreach to be user-centric and intent-based. And we cannot do it without knowing who is in front of us. Um, and how you need to access your audience data will vary, of course, depending on your needs and specific goals. Um, for example, one month, you might want to know what city your constituencies live in, so you can plan a local event. Um, or maybe um, one day you want to look at the contacts that specifically told you not to reach out to them. So instead of going through all your contacts that fit your goal um, and your objective at that given moment, we can simply select the already existing segment. So imagine this is your audience. Um, whether you're start, starting from scratch or bringing an existing audience, your audience is where you'll store all your contact data. It's much more than a list of email addresses. It's a place to store everything you know about everyone you know. So you're always sure where to look and when to look. Um, and at this point, maybe Maya, could you maybe um, ask the first call question? Of course. Thank you. Of course, of course, of course. So this is to understand. 
understand um, how well you know your constituencies, your audience, basically. How much time do you think is enough, Maya? Maybe 30 seconds or? Let's, let's see how it goes, because uh, you just, everybody has to read the question and the answers and the first yeah, okay, quotes okay. are in. So let's, let's give participants just a minute. Not literally a minute, maybe like 20 more seconds. No pressure. But yes, the votes are coming in. 40%. 50% of people have voted. Okay, last, last clicks. Okay, I'm ending the poll and sharing the results. Perfect, so I see that the majority um, yeah, it's a close call, but I would say, okay, so this question, I wanted to check what you do basically around your database. And I see that the majority is keeping around four to eight columns to manage their database. And think of these columns as like every single piece of data you have about your audience. Um, so when you think about the columns of your database, Probably the first one is email and then name and then maybe address, like the basics. And then you kind of go towards the more detailed side of things, maybe location, maybe um, information about how you met initially. If you are collecting donations, did they donate? Did they support? Did they volunteer? So how you know them? And, um, and this is great, I think, to start with. Um, but hopefully I will try to explain why segmenting your audience is also important, why using tags is also important. Um, so let's move on. I want to talk about MailChimp. Um, so I'm sure you're familiar with this tool. Um, to me, it's not only an email marketing tool, um, I think it's a great CRM tool as well. And the reason I feel that way is it's the easiest to me. And I think the most useful tool is the one that you use the easiest. Um, and MailChimp made things really easy. More importantly, there's a great amount of resources, videos, um, how to guide. Um, and the fact that you can just upload your spreadsheets, create tags, and directly start email campaigns. And to me, the most impressive part is you can integrate your social media channels, your website, and any other channel. They always add more channels to their integration list. Um, so instead of working with a developer and going into that dark path where you don't really know what's going to happen, someone else is doing that work for you. Um, to set up a newsletter functionality to your website, for example, you can just create a MailChimp landing page in your own existing website. Um, and that's it basically. Um, and you know that it's integrated. So instead of manual work, the contact is already added to the newsletter email campaign and the contact is already tagged as subscribed. I think there's great value in knowing someone willingly joined your newsletter. We are fed up with spam emails. We're not sharing our email address with everyone. We don't want random emails that we can't even remember giving consent for. So someone that wants to receive your newsletter, I believe is a very valuable contact. When we send emails from our personal business email address, we have to make sure we are abiding anti-spam and GDPR laws and regulations. But MailChimp and all other platforms do it for you. And you can start with a free account. It lets you add 2,000 contacts to your audience. And I believe it lets you send 10,000 emails per month. For all paid subscriptions, there's also a 15% discount for nonprofits, as far as I know. Um, but whether you're using MailChimp or not, the key for me is one audience database. So instead of keeping having 
different spreadsheets for different types of people, different segments of your audience. Just imagine having one audience database so that it can look like something like this. Think of all the ways that you meet people, events, trainings, and workshops. You may meet people for possible collaboration opportunities or newsletter signups, leads from petition signups, or donors for your supportive base. Having all people in one secure database and using tagging and segmenting accordingly is to me what successful database management looks like. So um, this is going to be quite a fast um, webinar. So I'm going to be switching from concept to concept. Um, I'll be dropping a lot of names about tools. Um, but please don't take them as endorsement or um, telling you a recommendation that you should be using that specific tool. I'm just trying to show my own personal experiences and knowledge about different tools. Um, I believe the true value, again, of a tool is your ability to use it effectively. Um, so let's move on to tracking and insights. So imagine this, I'm spending 40% of my time writing a blog, assuming that I'm educating my audience. I'm talking about my blog in my social media. One day I decide to check what the website visitor figures look like. And I see that there's actually a high traffic, but I also see that they only stay for six seconds. Um, so I dig deeper and I see that 70% of people coming to my blog are coming from mobile devices. And I know for a fact that my website is not mobile responsive. So I find out that people just come in and just do nothing, can't consume the content and just leave. Um, this is a big damage to my efforts actually. All the time I spent is not paying off because of this user behavior. So now I have a question to answer. Do I stop the blog altogether or do I use resources to improve my blog's mobile responsiveness? Um, can I continue my blog elsewhere or is my website really crucial for the transparency and credibility of my work? To me, noticing that an effort is not worth it, it is still a win. By simply not doing it, I am making a progress already because now I know that I can use that resource for something else and time is really limited for us. This can be a difficult conversation though. Without data, it can sometimes become an impossible conversation um, to decide to stop or not to stop. The same goes for new ideas. I can only accept a new idea if I know that it's working. So to me, it's all about gaining insights and making sense. For the user-centric approach in our online presence, tracking the touch points is key to make informed decisions. Now I know that there are hundreds of metrics, hundreds of platforms, and the confusion around tracking is maybe what makes it so intimidating for many. Um, but let's just simplify and just focus on easy to implement practices in our workflow. Let's think of our channels of communication, the user touch points, um, because these user touch points are the meaning, are the moments that matter, basically. Okay, so let's take a step back. Um, imagine we're hiking and lost. Before panicking, what do we do? Um, having gone through it a couple of times myself, I usually look at two things, the environment, the external factors, and myself, the internal factors. Both are equally important. Environment will give context about my location by observing what's around me. Internal factors such as water supplies, equipment like a compass, or my remaining stamina may give me an understanding of my current state. I think both are equally important to get me out of this. And we all know when lost, Making circles is inevitable when we have no coherent decision. In a similar way, I usually think of two main aspects to gain insights. The environment, external tracking, user touch points, internal tracking. 
While doing so, let's aim not to add complexity and aim to use resources effectively. So free tools and platforms are handy to at least get an idea and to gather insights. Google Trends is always useful to gather insights about what people are talking about and the volume of activity on topics that matter to me. We can set up Google Alerts to automate our external observation. Let's think our channels of communication now, the user touch points. With internal tracking, we can start making those discussions, take steps that are backed by data, and again, continue the user-centric, intent-based approach. I tried to give some examples here. Um, maybe you use some of them, maybe you don't. And hopefully you'll get this deck at the end of uh, the webinar later. Um, so you can just refer back to these tools and check them out and just start using them, at least test them. And if they're useful, that's perfect. So I touched on Google Trends a little bit. Here's an example. Um, by the time I was doing the, this, um, this session at Megaphone, um, I was curious about these three terms in Turkish. Um, so in Turkish, savaş means war, seçim means elections, and depression is yes, it's depression. And by the time I did this comparison, US announced withdrawal of troops from Northeast Syria, and Turkey started their military operation entering North Syria. Um, and this was around October, as far as I believe. If I'm an organization working towards breaking the taboo and stigma around mental health, let's say, and trying to create spaces to start conversations, then listening to what people are searching on Google is definitely useful. Because most of the time, I can argue if it's useful or not, but when there's something wrong with us, we feel sick or we don't know what's happening, we usually Google it and it's obviously always bad things. Um, so looking at the trends data, look how war and depression go parallel. Look at the correlation between the two and how elections always keep their stable presence as a topic showing signs of instability. As an organization, I can get the insight that at times of military operations, people search on news around war, yeah, and these periods make people more vulnerable. They search about depression more, probably with the hope to learn more and self-help. This can impact my communication strategy and help me shift my communication to more relevant issues that affect day-to-day -day lives of the public. This is user-centric intent-based approach in a nutshell, basically. Now, let's take a look at how a basic internal tracking looks like. I'm sure you're familiar with this source medium view at Google Analytics. For example, the classic source medium view, I can already see a lot by just observing the channels that bring the traffic to my website. I can see how the users consume the content, how many pages do they view before leaving, and how much time do they spend. It's basically up to us how technical, how much granular detail we, can, we get. This is a good starting point. And if you want to take things further and want to find out more about the traffic coming from a prominent channel, then just focus on tracking of that channel first. Don't confuse yourself with you know, 13 different channels. Instead of, trying, um, instead of trying to track everything all at once, basically. So in this example, looking at these numbers, I would definitely want to check out Facebook Analytics as I get more than 55% of my total traffic from there. And just a note here, um, I think it used to be way more complicated to implement Google Analytics to your website. Um, but if you're like many others and using WordPress or um, similar uh, platforms to manage your website, I think there are a lot of plugins that you can use um, by simply downloading. I think there are free versions of those plugins as well. And in a couple of clicks, by downloading a couple of plugins, you have this in front of you. So let's switch again to content creation now. Um, so of course, we won't have time to actually create content during this session. But maybe 
you know, when you have the time or now, um, list down all tasks required to finalize a four week calendar with scheduled content on each week. It's up to you how many pieces of content you want to publish. It can be video, voice, image, text, or any other creative way. Channels are up to you as well. And don't just think about online here. Consider other channels if you want. So if you decide to publish an article on your website, write down all the tasks required in the previous days to actually publish that article. And um, with that, I want to introduce the pillar content model. Um, I think this is a great strategy if you find it time consuming and difficult to create relevant, engaging content on a continuous basis. I think Gary V, an internet personality, came up um, with this or maybe just named this concept. Con concept to be honest, I'm not sure. Um, it basically adds efficiency without limiting creativity. Um, the premise is this, content creation on a consistent, continuous way is super hard. It requires both mechanical tasks, but also a lot of creative tasks as well. Um, on top of all, getting your content to the public, making your voice heard among millions of content is even harder. So there are four main tasks to think about in this model. First is document. So an, Basically, we're not always comfortable in front of a camera, or we don't always enjoy holding a phone towards someone. So instead of creating content as a starting point, try to put documenting at the beginning. Um, so to give an understanding, documenting, unlike creating, is a more natural process. It can be a 10 minute chat to an expert in a room with the camera or voice recorder placed somewhere to capture the content. Or it can be an evidence-based video where you just cycle around the city to show the traffic problem. So it's just a piece of real life. The longer your documentation is better. This is not your final piece and you will have time to edit accordingly, but this is basically your pillar content. Then comes create. Um, here, I want you to basically think about allocating time to create smaller pieces of content by slicing, dicing, cutting, editing the pillar content. Um, you know your channels of communication, but you may not always know exactly what content specs each channel require. Um, and you don't have to memorize those either. So instead of thinking of this at the beginning, when you're creating the, the initial con content, Think of it when you create it and create accordingly. Um, I really enjoy using Canva for this. It's free and I believe it saves a lot of time. Um, by selecting pre-selected Facebook post templates, you don't have to worry about learning about Facebook's image specs. Or an infographic, which I believe is a great way to compress a lot of information in a small space. Um, next comes listening. And this is, of course, uh, go, this goes back to tracking, basically. And um, hopefully, I will get questions at the end. Um, and I'm sure you have a lot of questions around content creations. Um, but I suggest you to try this pillar content model and compare the the workload um, and see whichever is easier for you. Okay, um, the first part was testing our preparedness. Um, and this coming part will test our ability to actually make our voices heard when there's chaos. During fire, it will be even harder for the public to distinguish between real and fake content. And being loud may seem like being right at these times. There will be many more manipulators, trolls, extremists from all directions and unfortunately, there is a possibility of existence of a group that probably benefits from this fire. So how can we contribute to the positive narrative? How can we investigate this fire by giving the public fact-based, relevant information, and of course, in an engaging way? How can we mobilize our supporters and amplify our voice? We need to provoke critical thinking here. And for that, we may need to remind the public about the power they possess 
and about what's at stake. As our storytelling might become more defensive, more under threat, for me, the key is to use time and timing effectively and to use the tools that make a difference. So I want us to think about the ability to make the decision to call this fire and initiate the fire workflow. So I think we've seen it maybe in the last couple of weeks, different countries announcing uh, different measures at very different times. Um, I think it's quite an important quality um, meaning maneuvering and saying, okay, this is fire when it's actually happening. Second is focusing our content on the user, on the intent, basically. Um, and then reminding ourselves the limitations of the online landscape and ways to overcome these. And lastly, the audience and when and where to reach out to them, basically. So as timing is crucial, um, obviously, we need to shift our routine into a different workflow. Um, to me, the benefit of such a workflow is to be on the same page without the need to confirm along the way. The mind shift will provide a much needed pace in our work and let us focus on what matters and what's going on around us. So someone might, may need to be outside long hours documenting, maybe not nowadays, um, and live streaming. Someone may be in front of the computer, editing, creating content, and sharing what's happening in real time through social media. Um, one of us might have crucial information, so simply having a dedicated chat group and ensuring all to get their updates from there might be needed. Um, and just think of little simple tweaks here. Maybe you use WhatsApp on your phone, but if you use WhatsApp desktop app, Maybe you could make things way faster because you're using the content from that WhatsApp group. Due to the circumstances, we, maybe we won't see each other the whole day, but our ability to ensure flow of information, flow of data, and communicate effectively will keep us efficient and functional in this fire. Okay. Um, so I keep telling this. Um, I seriously believe in this um, and I've seen it being useful in my previous work. So I suggest you test this way of thinking in your online presence efforts. And why is this concept important to me? And why does it matter even more at times of fire? Um, to me, it is different than just communication, marketing or PR. Because in those, there's a narrative created by the organization. And it's usually known or predicted when and where it will happen. Basically, it's like binary, meaning every action has a reaction like a tennis match. This might work to some extent, but at times of fire, I don't think it's enough. I think our online presence is the sum of all our content, all the public's communication with us and about us that is online it's sometimes beyond our control if it's positive or negative. Especially at times of fire, our control may be even more limited. Um, so we might ask ourselves, how can we shape our online presence? Um, by steering away from an organizational tone of voice, by putting the user at the center and presenting them the chance to act is at the core of user-centric intent-based content. Every time we post something, every time we send an email, write a blog, or do a live stream, think about two things. Who the audience is and how it settles inside the daily life of the audience, and what next step or action it presents. So I say, in all our efforts around online presence, if I'm user-centric, then I put the users, the public's interest and needs at the core. I choose my methods in line with how the public is consuming content, basically. But this does not mean that I should only say things that people want to hear. It simply means putting the public's interest at the core. At this point, there is a fire taking place. So let's think of the way they notice the fire. Think of the room they sit in. Think of the place that they're at. 
think of what they are doing, the channels, devices that they're using. And of course, most important, think if they know what's at stake for them. For issues that we already have relevant content, we can use that as pillar content and start creating micro content out of it. Um, but as in most fire situations, we will still need to generate new content on the go as news emerge. So it will mean timely updates and maybe live content. I'm not saying one channel is better than the other. We've had, I think, great webinars the last weeks explaining new ways of reaching to people. I'm still trying to familiar, familiarize myself to them as well to this day. Um, basically, we simply want to reach out to our audience and aim for transmitting the message, the feeling, the state of mind that we're in. It can be on Facebook, email, WhatsApp, or TikTok. What matters is that the decision should put the user at the center. I think it is important to note again that user-centric does not mean giving the people what they want. In summary, it's understanding who the audience is, accepting how they consume content, and presenting our original content in that way. Um, so at this point, Maya, could we do the second poll? Of course we could. But just, just a quick note that we are, it is already quarter to one. Yes. Uh, so and three. Question two. Just two answers this time, so it it can be a quick one. Mm -hmm. Great. Fifty percent already. Okay, last clicks. Last clicks, last clicks, because <laughs> there's like one by one coming in. Okay, I'm ending it and sharing the user results. Okay, so uh, this is usually the same situation among many organizations. And I really don't, I can't say which way is better. Some say that you should have a specific set of target number of social media posts to keep consistency. Some say it depends. My suggestion is to test both. So for like, let's say a month, like two months, try to keep up the same number of posts every week and then do the other way and just simply look at the results. And in my own experience, I've seen that having a consistency is actually working, but I can't really say that can, that should be true for every organization. Okay, let's move on. Um, and this is purely about next steps. Why am I sharing my thoughts, feelings, or ideas in the first place? Just for likes or just for website clicks? What's the point in that? Um, I personally do not find engagement trade as a, success, as a useful success indicator. And for actual change, we need to present real opportunities for action. So when scrolling down, reading, watching, on the surface, it looks like we're staring at a piece of plastic, basically. But in reality, in this world full of endless content, we want to go through thoughts and feelings. Um, and these are what we seek, basically. So in our case, we must think about capturing those intense rich moments and present actions in those moments. Um, it can be calling people to a protest, provoking them to participate in a discussion, or signing a pledge, or maybe asking for donation. But there has to be an intent for our content. A call to action takes us one step further from only getting a like or engagement. Um, 
so imagine like a um, situation where, okay, this is an example where you can imagine there's this um, forest, there's a village nearby, and then there's this international uh, mining company uh, getting um, permissions to blow up the whole place and start mining and disrupt the ecosystem there. Um, I think um, you can think of, you know, posts like by simply putting in A, the channel, B, your text, C, rich media, video, or image, and then D, your call to action. Um, this is a good example, a good exercise, because it's a complicated situation where, okay, the environmentalists can say this can't happen, um, but at the same time, there may be another group saying that this mining company is going to provide jobs for this unemployed population in this village. So think of these kind of situations where there are two ways, there are two discussions, two sets of uh, thinking, and pick a, like, pick a direction, pick your channel, pick those four variables, and have your own narrative around it. Um, I think there's a lot of discussions if we need Facebook ads, do we really need boosted posts? Are we just slaves of Facebook and these paid activities? Um, as Facebook changes their algorithms, um, where it used to be easier for pages to appear on timelines, nowadays it's harder because Facebook um, is shifting towards a more um, closer interaction um way where you want to hear see more from your relatives friends um and from groups maybe um so again here i suggest to test but test first the organic approach um and test for these six items when you do your organic reach um I believe this checklist is quite useful when it comes to improving your organic reach. And if you don't get results through your organic uh, posts, then you may start thinking about uh, spending little by little if you have the budget and see the results. Um, again, you will have this deck and you will have this checklist. Um, so for the sake of saving time, I'm just going to skip this. One big advantage of paid posts is doing more targeted posts. So you know your core audiences and you also have your custom audiences. And the key is whether you're using only like demographics or interests or behaviors, or you're more technical and you combine your site visitor data or contact lists as custom audiences. And think of vulnerable groups, and the general public, and who you want to reach out in, in, that, uh, uh, in that particular campaign. Um, so I don't know how many of you are using Facebook Audience Insights, um, but you can really get a lot of information, um, not only about your page, but also the whole Facebook um, sphere. And this gives you a lot of insights about like mobile phones usages or specific locations, about like post like behaviors and commenting behavior. And you can just benchmark yourself again against these. And one, um, another piece um, of really useful tip for me, especially for during times of fire, and I've been reading about this new approach in email campaigns, which is um, no logo, no image, just using Times New Roman font. Of course, it's not uh, super important which font to use, but apparently Times New Roman is working effectively here as well. And this is backed by um, experiments done by an organization called Next After, um, a nonprofit fundraising optimization um, organization. Um, and they saw that, especially at times of fire, during these kind of times where the communication is more serious, um, these type of plain emails work better to generate website traffic, engagement, 
and the actions that we want to get out of. Um, so the last piece I want to talk about here is customizing. Um, if you haven't been using this, I strongly suggest to start using it um, by using, like I said, an email marketing tool instead of your uh, personal or business email address and manually sending emails. Test this out. Um, the personalization, the field of name really makes a difference. Um, so the last part, um, as reality stands, we probably will have a new fire basically, like I said before. And we just start to grasp the effects of the previous one. Um, here, I want us to focus on combining the database efforts, tracking efforts, and email or other channels and creating a user journey. So it should look like something like this. Um, and this is the last slide, I promise. Um, in my conversations, I try to find out if people I meet are optimistic in general. Uh, I also wanted to find out what they see as the most effective way to solve many of the problems we deal with. Um, like policy change, educating people to choose wisely in future elections. And these are long term. Um, and if we don't think about the long term in our smaller activities, um, then we really don't know if we are making any impact or not. So just imagine creating a persona, thinking of um, someone that is exposed to your content. And you just basically made an organic post. And, and this was during the fire. And they clicked on this organic post, somehow engaged with it. And, and then this put them in the interested audience list that you created. And then using this audience list called interested, you make now a paid post specifically targeting this audience list. And now you ask them to sign a petition. And once they do so, they're giving you more information about themselves. And now they're part of the positive change audience list. Um, and then imagine doing another campaign to them, sending them an email because you have this data now, and you are asking them to attend to a panel. And the ones that are SVP, let's call them active change makers. And now this is a new audience list. And you can start imagining where this is going. And then you can design your future audience list. You can ask them to be your volunteer. You can ask them to be your protester, ambassador, or donor. And this is the future audience list. And this is going to take place post-fire, basically. This can't happen in a day. But by um, linking the gaps between these separate activities, you just carry this person from just person that clicked your organic post to becoming, let's say, your donor or ambassador in a future situation, because we know for a fact that it will happen again. And thank you so much for listening to me. Um, I think we're a bit over time, but um, I hope it was useful. And um, like I said, hopefully you'll get the deck. And um, I guess we have some tiny bit of a time for questions. Uh, you will definitely get the, the slide deck alongside with the recording of the uh, link to the recording of the webinar. Um, but yes, thank you, Mark. And um, yeah, is are there any? It was a lot of uh, uh, a lot of very useful content. Um, a lot of it probably more advanced than some people are used to, but maybe not. Maybe that's just like that's my assumption. But maybe there are things you would like to take this opportunity and ask Mark uh, about some things you maybe didn't quite understand or would like to know more about. You can post, uh, you can post the questions in the, um, in the chat uh, box. Um, Matteo, yeah, I... yeah you see, Matteo, Matteo is saying that he missed uh, the part about the mining example. I agree. I rushed there a little bit. Basically, what I tried to say there is think of a scenario for yourself and you are going to do a social media post about it. But instead of thinking just about your um, 
position your way of thinking in that situation um, I suggest you to basically consider what others can be thinking about it because it will manifest itself in the comments section and the reactions that you get and that example was basically saying that you have a mining company and they somehow got uh, permission to destroy a forest uh, to start mining with the promise of providing jobs for the nearby village. Um, and in that example, uh, there are basically four variables um, for you here. If, if you're thinking about making a social media post, um, the channel that you want to select, the, the the text that you want to use, the rich media that you want to use, and the most importantly, the call to action. Um, and there, in that example, I wanted to show you that um, by coherently choosing these four elements on your next um, online presence um, is going to be useful because you're just simply not, okay, uh, let's say something on Facebook or let's just write something on Twitter. Just um, I try to show you maybe trying to be more coherent in your decision making there. Great, thank you. There's one more for from Boglarka. Um, Mark, what do you think about building groups, online communities around our topics? Do you have any tips for it? I think it's, I definitely see the value there, especially with the algorithm changes um, at Facebook. I believe groups are now um, they have quite an advantage against uh, pages. Um, so I would definitely suggest you to test out um, groups instead of uh, like on the side of pages that you have. Um, to be honest, in a tip that I give or hear, I don't want people to accept my tips as things that I believe are simply true. I always test on my own when I hear something. Um, so I definitely suggest you to test it out and see, it, see the results. If it shows improvements, then go for it. And um, yeah, I was thinking about Facebook groups, but uh, think of the communities beyond Facebook groups. Think of um, WhatsApp groups or uh, Telegram um, groups. And um, I believe groups bring out a higher element of involvement for the members and um, so i believe if someone joined your group like the example of newsletters basically if someone joined your group they are way, way more likely to to go with you all the way to your cause basically to your next call to action mm -hmm. great Maybe time for one last one, as we are, it's already after two. Last question on your mind, because I can, uh, I have one, uh, but I think it's, um, it might be basic, but it might be useful to some people, because you've, um, you've talked about um, a, a basic spreadsheet as a way to start. Um, do you think that's the, like, if somebody is not as fluent is in digital communication, do you think that's really the first step? And if so, do you have, like, any other good tips or templates, maybe, too, that people could use? Um, there are loads of templates, and it's quite complicated when you search for them. But I think it's really important to start with a spreadsheet. Um, this already makes you accept the fact that you have to know your audience um, obviously for that spreadsheet to be useful you need to populate it and for you to be able to populate it um, it may require some initial manual work because you may have bits and pieces in different spaces um, but once you have all your audience in one spreadsheet then it's going to be super easy and simple to just adding segments and tags to it and you will know definitely how you meet a specific person and then do a more targeted campaign towards a specific person sure 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 maybe you, and i can share a template definitely exactly um, we'll share it in the in the email and literally last one um because you talked a lot about, uh, a lot about things to to do 
uh, maybe uh, the best lessons learned, meaning things to avoid. Uh, things to avoid? Yes. Or like that I, you've learned yeah. that you've done something that you now wish you didn't. And this is a, something, a mine that we could all uh, avoid thanks to your experience. Okay. Um, maybe, yeah, to finish it, maybe. Um, I really don't like the word expert. Um, and I think, I don't know, if someone co is calling themselves an expert and if you read something out there, like any how to guide or watching someone doing a webinar, let's say, um, I think it's not important what they're saying as if it's true and the only truth. I think every um, experience is different and your experience is going to be different using a specific tool or doing something on your own. So I did this in the past and I noticed that it's super stressful and it's not useful when you accept every single suggestion and try to implement a lot of things and complicate things. Instead, I really wish if there's one thing that I want you to take out of it, I really wish you to think about your audience and make this user centric intent based approach. And if this means using tools and different approaches, just give it some time. Don't make it all at once. Don't just think about analytics and then content creation and then another thing all at once. One by one, think of them and test every single thing. If someone tells you to use boosted posts for sure, definitely 100%, just leave some room uh, for the benefit of doubt and just test the other route first before accepting that truth. That's a great advice. <laughs> um, okay, thank you. We'll be finishing up. Thank you, uh, obviously, Mark, uh, for, uh, for doing uh, the webinar today. Thank you to everyone who participated and uh, uh, posted questions. Uh, thank you to Anna, who has been helping, uh, helping us out throughout the whole process. Um, and thank you to, to, especially to the participants who have been with us throughout the whole series. Uh, we will, you will all receive uh, all the links, Mark's presentation, recording the templates, and then in a follow-up email uh, tomorrow. And obviously, we encourage you to follow Text of Europe's uh, social media uh, channels, where we will be uh, putting information about any other educational activities, maybe webinars as well. Um, in the in the near uh, future. Thank you so much, uh, and have a have a good rest of the week. It's almost. And Maya, over. thank you. Bye bye. Bye everyone. <laughs>